Well, 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 everybody. Seems like we've got some decisions to bake. Make. Bake? Yes. Yes, let's bake some de decisions into a delicious cake. I'm very tired. Can you You're, right, you're right there, Ellen? Uh, <laughs> well, I have being, to make... Being a kindred is hard for I you, have isn't to, it? I have to think and make decisionies times and also speak to you. You know, I've got at least three plates in the air. So, we have one Coterie member in tow. We've got a thing that Sophie wants to, me to do or... Um, I meet with a Tremere, D'Angelo, or a Tamika. Um, I think I want to... We haven't done D'Angelo in a while. We've met him and uh, left him to investigate his moiders. But uh, I was having a lot of fun with him. So I think I want to do that. But first, I will rest. Because I need to. <laughs> knock, knock. In the game or real life? <laughs> Both. <laughs> you... Y'all are okay if I just take a 30 minute nap right now, right? The thrilling gameplay. <laughs> I take over. Knock, knock. I'd ask who's there, but I don't know if the sheriff of New York City would play along. When I open the door, I see him toying with the car keys he's holding in his hand. Ready to go, fledgling? I don't feel like it, but I give him a nod nevertheless. Excellent. Stay close. He leads me down to the vehicle he's parked nearby. Once again, he takes the wheel, literally and figuratively. Everything inside is just the way I remember it, down to the rear view mirror reflecting the intense stare of my guide. However, the trip itself feels notably different. The last time Kadir drove me around, he was forcibly dragging me away from my old life. This time, he's pulling me back into it. God damn, Newman. You're getting vi I'm getting violent just thinking about him. Let me know, uh, well, <laughs> let me tell you how it's going to go. As I've said, as I said, I've arranged a meeting between you and your kin. It's going to take place somewhere you should know very well. I'll watch over, uh, I'll watch over you two from a safe distance to make sure you adhere to the rules. You should know these very well, but I'll reiterate just so that you can't just so you can't ever say I didn't warn you. I don't like how he speaks. <laughs> I don't like how he speaks either, but I suspect for two different reasons. Mm. Don't do anything that would violate the masquerade. Don't establish some sort don't establish some secret routes of contact. I will know. Do treat do treat it as the last time you two will meet. Take this chance to wrap up everything. No pressure. Here's your story. You're fine. Found yourself at a crossroads, decided to radically change your life, and move out of the city. The subway is unbearable, the rent is too high, they've heard it all. However, you do not appreciate being accused of a crime you didn't commit, so you're back both to clear your name and to strike fear into the heart of the real culprit. By now, you should know how to cause fear among the living, right? He smirks at me. Have fun. As long as you don't leave a mess for me to clean up, we should be good. The car makes a sudden turn. I'll leave the finer details to you. Just be so kind and don't make me regret it. I can sense he's going out of his way for me, but doesn't try and force but he doesn't try to force me into gratitude by stating it plainly. If I know, I know. He'll see if I'm worthy of his aid. We're here. <sighs> this guy plays too many mind games. Mm. Frickin' hate it. Mm. I take a look around and recognize my destination. He was right. It is a familiar place. It's the office in which I wasted the best years of my life. Newman should be up there. Apparently someone is blackmailing him with documents proving his penchant for embezzlement. Poor guy is stuck in his office and he's probably pretty shaken up. The documents don't exist. But it would be a shame if someone went there, wiped the floor with the man, found proof that he pilfered the funds and forced him to admit his crimes. Ugh, me, I guess. Yeah, you. He turns off the engine and relaxes comfortably in his seat. I silently leave the car and head straight for Newman's office. The elevator ride up just doesn't seem to end. After what feels like five hours, but in reality is closer to 30 seconds, I finally reach my floor. My ex-boss is sitting in his office, just like Kadir said. He looks, how can I put it? 
as if he has just Googled body language of alpha males and attempted to poorly copy the most cartoonish posture in, in order to intimidate the blackmailer. Out of habit, I take a deep breath as I step into his office. Ellen. He immediately relaxes. It's just Ellen, his eyes say as a sly grin appears beneath them. Forget to ask for a vacation. People were terrified, you know. Not to mention overworked to Helen back, then overworked some more. Someone had to take over your responsibilities. And guess what? Just as we started digging into your work, some unexpected financial irregularities started popping up. We'll need to uh, we'll need to work on a common story to explain those, you see. I keep quiet and just stare him down. The poor idiot still thinks he's the predator in the room. Let's see how long it takes for him to realize his mistake. Newman senses that I'm different, somehow. He attempts to stare back but fails to withstand my glare. He starts to wonder what's going on and quickly arrives at a conclusion. Wait a second. So you're the one who sent me that message. Now oh, that's a laugh. He I start- like how I've gone for an Ocker voice. You have, mm. but I think that's right. Mm. Yeah, He starts approaching me. Sweetheart, if I'm going down, you're going down with me. You think you could convince anyone that you never knew what was going on around here? Fat chance. And even if you did, you know my friends. They'd never let you live it down. He's right in front of me, licking his lips, pondering the best way to display his complete physical superiority. I won't give him the chance. Scare the shit out of him. Before Newman blinks, I'm standing in front of him with my arms crossed. After he blinks, my hand is already on his throat. He freezes up. He watches me get in his face and slowly brandish my long, long fangs. A loud, throaty, inhuman growl rings out throughout the office and begins to morph into a violent hiss. For a moment, my ex-boss can't identify the source of the overwhelming sound, or rather his brain refuses to accept that my relatively small body is capable of generating a noise like this. As he begins to understand and process the unnatural sight of my fangs, he is gradually overpowered by an animalistic fear that shatters his entire worldview. I was supposed to be a victim. Why am I a threat? Why did reality break? I slowly tighten my grip on his neck, not hard enough to trigger a fight response, but enough to strike deeper fear into his heart. Kneel. Newman complies with my demand, squealing softly, a single tear making its way down the stubble of his cheek. Fuck, fuck, fuck. Obey. Oh, do whatever you want. Just don't kill me, please. I gather my strength and throw him, slamming him against his desk. Fuck, 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 fuck. A born boardroom predator has met his better in the place he least expected it. I slowly start walking toward him. Stop! Stop! I get it! I'll do it! I'll fucking do it! With shaking hands, he scrambles toward a safe on his de- on his shelf. He opens it and takes out some documents inside. This is what you want, right? This is what you want! I rip the papers from his hands and browse them. These should be enough to, as Kadir would put it, prove his penchant for embezzlement. I'll clear your fucking name! Tell them somebody else! You tw- I twist my heel into his hand. He screams. Ah! I did it! I'll, I'll tell them I did it! If you don't, I'll visit again. I walk into the elevator, press the ground floor button and wave at Newman as the doors start closing. He mumbles something under his breath and winces in pain. Back to Kitty's car. Once I close the door, he instantly puts his foot on the gas pedal. Walking off the pitch with no regrets? Said everything you had to say? I wiped the floor with him and got the documents that should keep him in check. That asshole will be looking over his shoulder constantly for the rest of his life. Kadir smiles deviously. Looks like you can take care of business, as I expected. I don't need to tell you to hang on to those documents, but keep in mind you can use them for more than just a security guarantee. We're always looking for more contacts among the big fish. Once you settle in, you can use what you know of Newman to convince the elders that 
he's better off as your ghoul. Now that's an enticing thought. I'm surprised at his suggestion. The car speeds up to cross an intersection before the light turns red. I give Kitty a good, hard look. <laughs> None of these are... Why are you not mean to me? <laughs> None of these are um, <laughs> dismissive of him. None of these are asserting dominance I know. over him. What I want to say is, why aren't you being a prick? Mm-hmm. Um, or, nothing. I can handle myself. Or, you don't need to patronise me, effectively. Yeah. I, that one sounds too, like, me. Me. Maybe that one. You've done a good job setting all of this up. He chuckles, visibly proud. If I couldn't handle something this easy, I wouldn't be holding my position, but... Then he takes on a serious, slightly sorrowful expression. Oh, I meant to feel bad for him now. Don't suck, don't suck up to me, kid. Mr. Bad Guy here is... Uh, Mr. Bad Guy is still here. And without a doubt, he will go back to decapitating suckers like you any time now. Oh, fuck off. <laughs> Sorry. The car starts slowing down. We're here. I look out the window and see my haven. Take care. I'll see you around. Just pray I don't have to see you too often. Ugh. Get over yourself. I leave the car and start walking to my haven, thinking about Kadir. I can't say I'm fond of him, but with what with the welcome he gave... I can't say I'm fond of him, what with the welcome he gave me and all. But after tonight, I can't say I aren't. I aren't? Fuck. <laughs> I can't say I'm not, either. <laughs> I think you can say you aren't <laughs> because you actually don't I like aren't. him still. <laughs> no, but I, I shouldn't say I aren't happy. I, you know? I do, yeah. <laughs> I'm going to need some more time to understand him, that's for sure. Okay, well. Now that's out of the way. Let's do what I actually want to do, which is see D'Angelo. He's a fun guy. I like him. I make my way through the now familiar rusty maze of the grain terminal and up to the stairs to D'Angelo's office. This time, however, I find the room firmly locked. There's a note pinned to the door. I rip it off and scan the crooked lettering. Uh, okay. <laughs> How was I doing it? Um, I kind of gravelly? bobbish. Uncle bobbish. Oh, Batman. But then you also, yeah, Batman. But with like yeah. a hint of noir. There's been another one. <laughs> I can see now. Come to Come to bed. S bed stew? That must be a, uh, a suburb. Yeah, a new, yeah. Come to bed stew. Stewie. Corner of... <laughs> sorry. <laughs> corner of... Pal Pal Palowski? Palowski? And gravel. It's hard to read yeah. uh, with the text like that. I think it's and corner my of dyslexia <laughs> does not help. <laughs> I think it's corner of Palowski and Garvey. Corner of Palowski and Garvey. ASAP. Looks like D'Angelo could use my help. Better get going. As I approach the address... You know what I wish? I wish he'd left, like, a little uh, trench coat. <laughs> mm, mm. <laughs> As I approach the address D'Angelo gave me, a squad car passes me by, sirens blaring. Following it, I make a turn from Del Cab Avenue onto Pulaski Street. Sure enough, the street is awash with red light and the four or so police cars parked on the nearest corner next to an ambulance confirm that I'm in the right place. I move closer to what appears to be a New York's finest convention, looking around in the hopes of spotting a familiar, if not altogether pleasant, face. No such luck. True to his Nosferatu lineage, D'Angelo is nowhere to be seen. I stop on the sidewalk across from the street, trying not to draw attention to myself. All of a sudden, one of the cops standing by the entrance to the building looks straight at me. He does a double take, and I instinctively look away. Bad move, I think to myself, as I notice him making my w his way towards me. Um, um, I'm just going to... Yeah, I ain't done nothing wrong. Not allowing panic to set in, I stand my ground, doing my best ordinary citizen impression. The cop waddles across the street towards me, his sense of authority putting that extra spring in his step. I try to remain calm, even as he puts his hand on the holster. Shit, I can't help but mouth the word. This is about to get messy. Suddenly he stops, as if instinctively realising that he was just inches away from a grisly demise. He waves at me dismissively and yells in a thick Brooklyn accent. Off you go, Chris. 
I can't do Brooklyn. What's How do you Brooklyn? Do, give me give me a Brooklyn demo. I I don't know. Isn't it just New? Is oh, isn't it just like a subset of New York? Yeah. A. <laughs> this a. Is, this here is an active That's crime scene. A- <laughs> Ugh. Uh, hey, this here is an active crime scene. Be on your way. I don't know. <laughs> I can't do American accents. Not hey, terribly. this is an active crime scene. Be on your way. That's, there, that's there like more New yep. York. I'm rubbish at Brooklyn. Yeah. I don't. I don't know what the difference Regional is. Regional dialects. I'm. I'm so rubbish sorry, at. everybody. I can do different voices, but I mm. can't do you know American yeah, yeah. or English. Uh, relieved, but not. Tr- uh, but trying not to show it, I put on a grumpy New Yorker face and start to walk away. As I make my way past a dark alleyway, someone grabs me by the arm and pulls me into the shadows. If the smell of cigars and cheap cologne didn't give him away, the gravelly voice sure does. Gravelly voice. <laughs> nice save. I mean, dumb to show your face around here in the first place. But still, come on. I'm parked around the corner. Before I know it, I'm sitting in the passenger seat of a busted old sedan parked half a block away, giving, a nice, giving me a nice view of the police gathering. We Feeding take. opportunity. <laughs> we can take him. <laughs> All of the cops. Um, let me talk to them. I'll get us in. Why don't I talk to them? I might convince them to let us in. I thought you were going to do the feeding opportunity. Them all? All sure. of the cops? <laughs> he gives me a look as if I just let rip a massive fart. Right. Look, kid. It's not that I don't trust you, but how about we give that... Raw animal magnetism of yours, a dry run, huh? Pretend I'm one of the cops guarding the entrance. Convince, convince me to let you in. What? Oh, uh, that's that D'Angelo, is I D'Angelo. think. Pretend I'm one of the cops guarding the entrance. Convince me to let you in. I'll pose as a tenant. Evening, officers. I live here. Is there a problem? Yeah, this here is an active crime scene. Be on your way. But. Hey, it's your boat <laughs> against mine. Get lost. Hmm. Maybe you're right. Of course I am. So what has she got? Feeding opportunity. <laughs> we can take him. Stop. Do it. No, okay, do what Do your you shadowy want. Suck, skull. Ah. Hey, how about you do your shadowy skulky thingy? Maybe you can find some way to let me in from the inside? Shadowy skulky thingy. Jesus, kid. Doubt is pat- phrasing aside. It's as good approach as any, I guess. Without another word, he gets out of the car and heads for a nearby back alley. I watch in silence as he disappears into the shadows. A minute passes, then another one, and another. I begin to worry. What if there were mo- more cops inside? What if my moldy partner has got him in se- gotten himself into trouble? Suddenly, a shadowy silhouette appears in one of the windows on the second floor. Looks like he made it after all. At least, I hope it's him. The shadow waves at me and points to the corner of the building opposite two cops. I get out of the car and quietly make my way towards the alley. Sure enough, I find that a fire escape ladder has been conveniently dropped for me. Good work, D, I mumble to myself as I climb to the second floor. Finding the crime scene proves easy enough. I just follow the yellow police tape and before I know it, I'm standing in the middle of what used to be someone's living room. The place has been completely trashed. Knocked over furniture, shattered glass, the works. Looking around, I notice a sign scribbled on a nearby wall. It reads, His gift, our fate. I'm no expert in typography, but the crooked letters look similar to the ones I saw back in Red Hook. Sure enough, there's very little in terms of blood, save the occasional stain that's bound to end up on a carpet once a that's bound to end up on the carpet once you toss someone through a glass coffee table. D'Angelo leans against the doorway. He seems lost in his thoughts, sucking on his cigar compulsively and mumbling to himself. I lean over a bit, trying not to make it obvious that I'm listening in. I manage to catch the last few lines of his monologue. The night's been kind to them so far, but the questions keep piling on, and now they've found themselves amidst the wreckage of another life. It was up to them to sift through the debris and come up with a neat little pile of answers. Suddenly, he tenses up, as if sensing my eyes upon him. Feel free to chip in, kid. Anything catch your eye? Hmm. No blood. Same as before. At least none spilled. 
So what does that tell us? Might be the kindred we're after. That this was a feeding? That the killer is kindred? Might be the one we're after. Might. Doesn't sound right. Let's not make assumptions until we see the body. Still, the pattern is consistent. God damn it. I hate where this is going. Which is? Me being right about thin blood involvement, I mean. Anyway, looks like we're not getting any more out of this place. No way around it. We gotta see the body. Sure. Might as well be prudent. In for a penny, in for a pound. My, thought exa my thoughts, exactly. The Duskborn have it bad as it is. If I'm going to accuse one of them of breaching the masquerade, I want solid evidence. I mean, ro fucking rock solid. Lucky for us, I might know someone who could get us an audience with our dearly departed. To my surprise, he pulls out a cell phone, a busted old clamshell. He flips it open and spends a good minute browsing through the contacts, muttering to himself. Finally, he makes a call. Hey. You know who this is. Yeah. That favor you owe me, time to deliver. Listen, I know how to get a f I know you got a fresh one, the murder in bed, Stewie. I need you to take a look. Yes, now. Yeah, you'd better. With that, he hangs up and gives me his trademark wry smile. Are we good? Yeah, we're good. Next stop, King's Country. King's County, the bleeding County. heart of... Yeah. <laughs> I mean, I could have yes-anded you, but... Dyslexia, how about it? <laughs> oh, good. The bleeding heart of Brooklyn. It's beating as hard as ever with ambulance after ambulance bringing in sick and wounded New Yorkers to be pumped through the tight arteries of the healthcare system. It's a dangerous place for a kindred to show their face, incessantly crowded and full of people who specialize in noticing all sorts of physical afflictions especially the sort that make up the very ens essence of a vampire's existence. For instance, death. Thankfully, my business here tonight keeps me away from the hectic human hive of the ER. Instead, I follow D'Angelo to a relatively quiet part of the underground parking lot that's closest to my current point of interest, the Kings County Morgue. Having found myself a conveniently and suitably unlit spot near the hospital wall, I wait patiently for D'Angelo's contact to appear. Every now and again, I get. Every now and then, I glance over at the undead gumshoe as if to make sure his mouldy mug isn't showing any signs of worry. It isn't, or at least he's very good at hiding it. Finally, after thirty minutes or so, a lone figure emerges from a side entrance. As the human-shaped shadow walks by, I'm quick to recognize him as the EMT I saw back at the murder site. Clearly nervous, the twenty-something-year-old redhead can't seem to help but look back and make sure no one is following him. Finally, he stops and lights up a cigarette. Without even looking in my direction, he takes a puff and exclaims, seemingly to no one in particular, <sighs> Room 112, you got twenty minutes. D'Angelo speaks without looking at me. There's our cue. I follow the fang detective through the same door the EMT walked out of, Luckily, this wing of the hospital seems unusually empty. Still, the confidence with which D'Angelo makes his way through the white and green corridors makes it clear he's been here before. Finally, he stops in, one of, in front of one of the doors. Room 112. That's my stop. The room is small, with only one oversized freezer by the wall and a single slab mounted in its center. Sure enough, the body of a middle-aged man is splayed out on its steel surface. Even for a dead man, he seems unnaturally pale. Extreme blood loss will do that to you. Try as I might, I can't help but look at the man's face, his features twisted in abject horror. This was not a peaceful death. Looking closely, I notice two small puncture wounds on the victim's neck. If ever there was a clearer sign of a vampire attack, I've yet to see it. Looking over at D'Angelo, I notice his lips moving in a familiar fashion. He's narrating again. Before he can utter an in intelligible wor word, I cut in with a remark. Look at his face. It's like nightmare fuel. No kidding. Which means he was fully aware all the way through. He knew he was dying. 
which, combined with the blood loss and the teeth marks on his neck, confir confirms our hypothesis. We have a serial thin blood on our hands. Fuck. As if on cue, the door swings open. A tired-looking man with a stethoscope around his neck walks in with his eyes fixed on his clipboard. He doesn't appear to notice us. Yet. I need to feed. I should probably feed. Go for it if you yeah. want. Letting my instincts take over, I pounce on the unsuspecting doctor, plunging my fangs into his aorta. The precious liquid tastes sickeningly sweet, making me feel a bit lightheaded. It appears the good doctor has been getting high on his own supply. It takes me a moment to get my fill, but when I'm finally done, I immediately feel D'Angelo's eyes upon me. I start coming up with an excuse, but he just smirks. You're quick, kid. I'll give you that. Beat me to it by a pube. <laughs> now, come on. Let's get out of here. Ah, oh, nice. We're friends now. Time to pay our dear Primogen another visit. Robert Larson's home looks about the same as last time. No added security. No angry dogs prowling the yard. It appears that the thin blood Primogen would rather risk another visit from his old pan pal D'Angelo than to arouse suspicion of his family and neighbours. You're still hungry. I am. That's whack. That is whack. Like I fed. Yeah. Hmm. Mm. Maybe you were very hungry? I might have been very hungry because obviously like in our fight with... Kara, yeah. I used a lot, a lot, yeah. a lot. Mm. Um, we'll see. Yeah, which is good considering he's about to get visited by D'Angelo. Mm. Sure enough, the light in Larson's study is on, and I even catch a glimpse of the man himself shuffling around the room. I look over to D'Angelo, wondering how we're going to get Larson's attention this time. Without a single word, D'Angelo walks over to a nearby street lamp and leans against it, making sure he's visible to any and all who happen to look. Looks like the time for subtlety is over. It only takes a couple of minutes for Larson to take notice. I see him lean against the window and storm out of the room. In mere seconds, he's out and in front of D'Angelo's face. Listen to me, you moldy fuck. I've had just about enough of your shit. You want to pester me? Fine. But leave my family out of it. For a moment, D'Angelo just stands there, motionless, allowing Larson to get his frustrations out. Suddenly, he grabs the thin blood by the collar, lifts him off the ground, and smashes his back against the lamppost. Are you finished? All right. Now you listen to me, and you listen good. You think I'm enjoying this? You think I like being joked around? You think I got nothing better to do than hang around with this little puppet theater you've made for yourself? Now, either you give me a lead I can follow, or I start remembering things I'd rather forget. For the first time since I met him, Larson looks speechless, his eyes wide with fear he can only mutter under his breath. You wouldn't dare. Try me. Cue awkward silence. I stand there, shifting my eyes from one vampire to the other. Guess it's time to either press the, ad press the advantage or play the good cop. That, look, we're all a bit stressed out. How about we all just take a deep breath, figuratively speaking? Nah, I don't feel like it. I tried being nice, but some people don't appreciate nice. Some people will do anything to cover their asses. Isn't that right, Robert? If you want my help, put me the fuck down. With his feet back on the ground, Larson straightens his collar in a faint attempt at preserving some shred of dignity. There's a place in Manhattan, Lower East Side, one of the few places in the city where my people can find shelter. Yeah, I know it. If you want that, if you go there right now, you might find what you're looking for. D'Angelo stares at him for a moment, just long enough to make it uncomfortable. We'd better. Finally, D'Angelo loosens his grip. I both, we both watch Larson limp back to his house, looking back over his shoulder like he's going to tell the teacher on us. I looked to my partner, meaning to ask what that whole things you'd rather forget deal was. As if sensing my curiosity, D'Angelo cuts in with a preemptive mutter. Come on, we got what we came for. As I reach the address Larson gave me, we find ourselves standing in front of what looks like an old garage. On the outside, the place looks as uninteresting as it gets. I'd think it abandoned if not for the few barely working lights illuminating its shabby facade. Once we're inside, however, if there 
ever was a place worthy of being called a wretched, wretched hive of scum and villainy. This is probably it. I think character's a bit of a nerd. Yeah. Just a bit. The room is littered with drunks and crackheads, human and thin blood alike, their minds lost in their cruel little worlds, their bodies splayed out across the floor. D'Angelo leans over and whispers in my ear. I'll cover the back door. You, f you stay near the front. Let's look around and see what we can find. Before I can ask what exactly I'm supposed to be looking for, D'Angelo disappears into the shadows. Uh, let's look around quietly. Doing my best to blend in with the crowd, which is fairly difficult considering my upright position, I slowly make my way across the large room. Not really knowing what I'm looking for, I focus on the details, a knowing smirk, a hateful stare, anything that looks even the slightest bit suspicious. After a dozen or so empty stares, I'm almost ready to give up, when suddenly, something catches my eye. A young, skinny woman, hunched in the corner of the room. She gives me a bewildered look, a thousand-yard stare that tells me, beyond a shadow of a doubt, it's her. As I walk towards her, D'Angelo emerges from the shadows right next to me. Nice catch. He kneels down beside her. I can tell he's trying to sound as comforting as possible, but with his gravelly timber, timber it's not really working out. Tombra? I don't know. That Tim? Yeah. Yeah. Hey, it's okay. We're not going to hurt you. We just want to talk. No, don't talk. Too loud. Too loud. She seems halfway out of it. It's like the lights are on, but whatever in whoever inside is stumbling around after one hell of a bender. All right. You're like quiet. Got it. Can you tell me your name? S Sana. That's what he called me. Suddenly, I hear the door swing open behind me. Even though the night is fairly warm, a cold chill runs down my spine. I look towards the entrance. There's a woman standing there, and something about her just screams kindred. Even though she seems comically overdressed for the situation, somehow I don't feel like cracking a smile. Whoever she is, I can tell she means business. She starts making her way to the back of the room, not making any effort to sidestep any of the junkies and drunks they all know well enough to get out of her way. Acting out of bravery or sheer stupidity, I walk up to her. She looks as if I was something she just scraped off her shoe. I smile nervously without even knowing it. Yeah, that's quite cool. As so oh, fuck, I didn't even get it out. <laughs> as soon as I open my mouth, her hand shoots out, grabbing me by the throat. The woman looks at me, tilting her head as if examining a curious species of insect. Suddenly, her eyes shift as she notices something behind me. Her face turns from disgusted curiosity to sheer annoyance. Uh, I'm trying to think of a voice I haven't done. You. Hey, Val. That's my assistant you got there. Do you mind? She rolls her eyes. I feel the grip on my neck loosen and sh I awkwardly fall to my feet. She makes her way towards D'Angelo, pushing me aside like a rag doll. Where is she? You're gonna have to be a bit more specific, darling. Don't play coy, Ginny. The Manslayer. I know she's here. A blood hunt has begun. By the order of the prince herself, the girl is to meet her final death. Let oh, let's mm, dictionary. Blood, blood hunt. hunt. A punish a punishment sentence sentencing a vampire to final death of the fangs of their peers. Or just anyway, you don't have to use fangs. Right. The code of the uh, the code of the kindred and the system for punishment. Punishing transgression is the law of retaliation. Okay. Uh, blood hunts can only be handed down by a prince, generally. Um, and uh, it's a... Uh, this person is no longer a part of our society. Kill him. Get him. Yep. Yep. Got it. All right. Hold your horses, honey. I'm conducting an investigation under the auspices of the sheriff. That counts for something, too. Look, sweetie, I'm not here for some clit measuring contest. You want this to get ugly? Be my guest. Otherwise, I suggest you step aside and let me do my job. By all means. 
He steps aside in a comically exaggerated fashion. I look at the corner where I last saw Sana, but find no trace of the girl. Well, I'll be. I could swear she was just here. Valerie looks at D'Angelo. She smiles softly, but I can tell she's trying very hard not to rip his head off. You'll regret this. Story of my life. Without another word, she turns on her heel and storms out. D'Angelo waves his hand in my general direction. Come on, kid. Let's get out of this shithole. As I emerge from said shithole, I feel the cool night breeze caress my face. It's soothing. It almost makes me forget how shitty the last few hours have been. Almost. Okay, kid. I know you got questions, but it's getting early, and I don't feel like having a Q&A session right now. For now, you got one question. Make it counts. Um... Hmm. That's... The girl's our main priority. It's still hard to believe that the girl is our killer. Do you know where she ran off to? Not sure, but I might have some ideas. The important thing is we know who we're looking for. Too bad Valerie knows it too. She's a scourge, kid. Part enforcer, part assassin, all-around all pain in the ass. We'll be seeing more of her, you can bet that. Bet on that. Scourge, an executioner, support, uh, subordinate, Sub subordinated, subordinated directly to the prince. Uh, scourges, right. their purview is um, sometimes under the sheriff as well. Uh, they are the killer. So if the right. sheriff is supposed to uphold the laws, the police, scourges are assassins. Yeah, um, gotcha. Yeah. Gotcha. And before you ask, yes, we've run into each other in the past. No. Don't feel like talking about it. Yeah, I mean, that much was clear. All right, kid. I don't know about you, but I'm turning in. I've got some stuff to figure out and keep looking for... I've got some stuff to figure out and keep looking for our girl. Feel free to swing by the office in a night or two. And with that, he stumbles off into the distance, not even bothering to keep to the shadows. I can't say I, I blame him. It really has been a rough night. The hunger calls to me. The city's skyscrapers, the, never seem, the seemingly never-ending sprawl of the burrows. It's all a prison. I need to get out. I need to take back control over my life this instant. The memory of my sire's frosty blue eyes mocks me, tempts me to show my dominance, to prove I have the guts to take what I want. Feeding. That's just the thing. Coaxing. No, ordering a mortal to bend to my will, drinking deep from their lifeblood. Faces pass me by. Well, some look more ravishing than others any would do right now. Have we not had this? The, yeah, this is the, like... I, this <laughs> um, you fed. The, it yeah. still thinks you haven't. And then... Yeah. I think this is just, like, the script that plays when you are hungry. Okay. Um, so I just must be really, really hungry, I guess. I guess. Um, I feel like it didn't register that feeding attempt. Yeah, mm. which is whack, but... What are you gonna do? Well, this has been a time. I, I guess I'm supremely hungry still. But um, we'll check bin back in with D'Angelo once he's had fine time to um, find our missing girl. And uh, we'll catch them crooks if it's the last thing we do. See? See? Bye. Yeah. Bye.